So welcome to week four of the Naked Marriage. And this week our topic is going to be naked sex. It's always naked. Or you know that. <laughs> Maybe not always, but you know that naked does not mean without clothes in this um, these sessions that we're having. It means everything open and vulnerable. And so that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Each of us have probably grown up with parents that are different from anyone else's parents. There are those who are lovey-dovey parents, happily married and not afraid to let anybody know about it parents, private parents, that was my parents, non-affectionate parents, <coughs> change the subject parents when it comes to intimacy, derogatory remark parents, so they try to make um, sex as unappealing as possible to try to deter your teenagers from uh, even wanting remotely to do anything like that. And then there were those parents who model sex as being good and fun. I don't know what you had, but my parents were very private. It wasn't even a word that we talked about. We never mentioned it in my home. So how do we kind of have the kind of sex life that God wants us to have? And we both come into the marriage with different perspectives on how things are supposed to be. We come from completely different sets of parents. A great place to start with trying to we'll be trying to meet each other's sexual needs. So the Bible gives us a roadmap when it comes to intimacy in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 3 through 4. It tells us the husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. If you're trying to figure out what that means, it means exactly what it says. You're not yours, and he's not his. He's yours when you want him, and she's yours when you want her, pretty much. <laughs> so, when it comes to intimacy, spouses are the only legitimate means to fulfill one another's sexual appetite. We can't go outside of marriage, and we know that. Sex is a gift from God that is exclusively for married couples, and we should try our best to cultivate a thriving sex life with our spouse by talking openly and honestly about it with them and having it often. So the strongest marriages have a husband who continuously pursues his wife. I never really understood until I like really started studying this book. Because I had never studied anything like this before. I've been to marriage conferences and seminars and things like that. But, but a husband continually pursuing his wife. That's why my husband is always trying to hug me. Or, oh, I just love you. You're so beautiful. I'm telling you, you're looking through rose-colored glasses is what I'm thinking. <laughs> but that's why he's always doing that. He, he's trying to... Not that he's trying to get next to me, but he's trying to show me his affection and, and show me how much he loves me. The strongest marriages have a husband who continuously pursues his wife. And then a wife who continuously affirms her husband. When we're dating, all this is easy. Because he's so handsome and she's so beautiful. They're perfect. You don't see any of the flaws. You haven't seen past any of that yet. Everything is great. But then you get married. And it starts to fizzle out the longer we're married. And we can start to lose that spark. We need to stoke the fire. Keep that alive. Keep it, keep it hot and keep it burning. Husbands, your wives want to know that you find her captivating. And ladies, your husband want you to know that you think that he's the man. And he's only your man. <laughs> The couples who have the best sex life have a man who continuously pursues romances and adores his wife and a wife who continuously affirms her husband and he shows her respect and believes in him. She shows her, he shows her respect and she believes in him. So this helps the husband and the wife to both be, both be at their best. Proverbs 5, 18 and 19 says, Let your wife be a fountain of blessing for you. Rejoice in the wife of her, your youth. She is a loving deer, a graceful doe. Let her breast satisfy you always, and may you always be captivated by her love. 
So what we have right there in that scripture is a beautiful picture of how a couple shares their passion for each other and with one another. When we choose to passionately pursue and to affirm one another, and when we make sex a priority, our marriages are strong. I don't think any of us are like this tonight, but maybe you've had some common but misguided views about God. I think all of us um, have pretty much always knew that God existed, but maybe you think He's cold or distant or out of touch, and He's looking down on anybody who's having a good time. But God is not cold. He's not distant, and He's not out of touch, and He's certainly not looking down excuse me, on people that are having a good time. We have a good time. We have a good time in church. We can laugh and the joy of the Lord um, is, is right there with us. So He's not looking down on people who are having fun. God created sex. And when you think about sex, you might visualize God, visualize God shaking His head in disappoint, disappointment or disgust. Always turn out the lights. Don't let anybody see this. Nobody's supposed to know about this. But He's the one who thought about it first. We didn't make it up. Adam and Eve didn't just come up with the idea. That's how God intended it to be. It's one of God's most awesome creations. He could have chosen to make us asexual. We just spawned off humans without any kind of relationship or any kind of love, no sex at all. But He chose to create sex. He chose to make it pleasurable for us. Perhaps one of the reasons why we get uneasy talking about sexuality is because sex isn't always a positive experience. Maybe in the past it's been something different for you. Maybe you've been hurt by someone. Sex is certainly a wonderful gift, but sometimes it gets misused and it's misplaced or even misunderstood. So when that happens, then there are all other kinds of baggage and things that come along with it. There's emotional pain that replaces the visual pleasure and the baggage finds its way into the bedroom. Whether you realize it or not, we all have some form of baggage related to sex. Remember I told you, your parents, the way they viewed it, that's how you come into your marriage. Oh, nobody's supposed to know about this. Or, hey, this is great. You know, and, and you might come together and not have the same ideas or the same views about it. So some of our baggage that we have has to do with past regrets. When we've made some sexual choices that were out of bounds of what God originally planned and designed to be perfect for sex. It creates a visual reel in our brains that we can see just full of images that we wish we could have erased. Things that we've seen or heard about or maybe done. We wish we could get rid of it. But sometimes our baggage comes from being raised with an unhealthy view of sex like I was telling you earlier. That misrepresented misrepresented what sexual intimacy was all about and it created misguided views or unrealistic expectations. Maybe you thought that it's always great, it's always grand, and it's always going to be nice and clean and, and, and fun. And it's not always that. Some of us may have baggage because of past abuse. These wounds can be the deepest and the most painful of them all. There are a staggering number of people who have been abused, molested, objectified, mistreated in a way that leaves deep, deep scars. It, it affects them within every relationship. But sex was never intended to be used as a weapon or to even hurt other people. That's not what it's for. It's not a lust-fueled form of self-gratification. It's not just to make you feel like a man or a woman to, um, oh, one more time, one more person that I've, that I've got under my belt. That's not what it's for. Lust sees people as objects to be used and exploited, but love sees people as souls to be cherished and respected. This is not in my notes. But before your husband was your husband, who was your brother? And before your wife was your wife, she was your sister, your sister in Christ. And so we need to treat them like they're our brother and our sister. We need to love them and cherish their souls and respect them and care more about them just than what can he give me, but care about their souls and their feelings. 
Intimate and invisible wounds can come from our own choices or from being the victim of somebody else's choices. These wounds can seep into a marriage and it can cause distrust, disunity, and discouragement. So if you're struggling to connect with your spouse inside the bedroom or outside, know that things can get better. It can change. This happens when both of us, both spouses, make sexual intimacy and fulfillment a high priority in the marriage. Me and I, if you're... If you're a normal man, I know you like to hear that. Women, if you're normal women, you probably don't like to hear that too much because that's not something that we rate high on the priority list most of the time. To women, most of the time, that's okay, but the kids come first, the dishes come first, I'm tired, so I'm going to get some sleep tonight. Yeah. It's kind of put on the back burner. Yeah. But it has to be made a priority. Um, in our marriage. Each spouse should put on the other spouse's or should put the other spouse's needs ahead of his or own, her own needs. The mutual selflessness is the key to a great sex life. But it's also key to a great marriage outside the bedroom. It's not all about inside the bedroom. Song of Solomon 1 and 2, it says, Kiss me and kiss me again. Your love is sweeter than wine. Anybody have any idea where that came from? The Bible. <laughs> right out of the Bible. So the Lord doesn't, He didn't intend for things to not be passionate, to not be steamy, to be mundane, to just be the ordinary, oh, it's one more time again. That's not what He meant for that to be. I mean, it's in the Word of God. It had to be important for it to for Him to give it to somebody, to speak to somebody, to put in the Word of God. Sex is a powerful gift, and when enjoyed with a committed marriage, it should be a passionate and pleasurable gift as well. The Song of Solomon is an erotic um, poetry about love. It's steamy, and God wants us to have that kind of passionate and playful intimacy within our marriages. Genesis 2 and 25, it tells us, Now the man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. They didn't have a clue. They didn't know they were naked. They just knew that's how it was. The first picture of sex and marriage that the Bible paints for us tells us that they had no shame. And this is a beautiful image of their vulnerability. They weren't worried about what they were looking at or what the other person was thinking about. They, were, they just had no shame. They trusted each other. It was honesty, transparency, and intimacy that, sh that would create a healthy foundation for every marriage. So God wants a husband and wife to be naked physically, spiritually, and emotionally with each other. We talked about the emotional side, and we talked about the spiritual side a little bit. But tonight, the physical side is as just, just as important as those other sides of the marriage. He wants us to have no secrets and total, total vulnerability that you can experience true and lasting intimacy without shame or fear. It's not just a physical act. It's a sacred, spiritual act as well. It doesn't happen. It's not supposed to happen until you have that bond and that holy matrimony, that coming together, that unity is when that is supposed to begin. And God created that as a sacred act. And we should keep it that way. When we forget, or we haven't been taught that sex is sacred, sometimes we get burned because we don't keep it sacred like it should be. When we reduce sex only to a physical an act of physical pleasure, we're using our partner instead of truly loving them or truly loving her. It's supposed to deepen our love one for another, not hinder it. It creates a bond with our spouse that, spouse that goes far beyond the physical. You have a bond with your spouse once you're married that you don't have with anybody else. It, there's none to compare it. I have a bond with my mother, but it's nothing like what I have with my husband. There are things that I might not tell my mother, but I'll just lay it all out there for my husband. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Do you know that your bodies are members of Christ Himself? 
Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. We would never do that. Do you know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her body? That means they're married in the eyes of God. First, the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 6, 15 through 17, the two will become one flesh, but whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. So when we unite with God, it's a binding agreement. And sex is the same way. It's meant to be binding. And this is why there's so much pain that comes along with things from the past. When we're promiscuous before we're ever married, there's a connection to those people that we really didn't even need to have. There's confusion. There's heartbreak that's involved in broken relationships with sexual partners that don't exist with others in any type of relationship. I think we all believe that lifelong monogamy within marriage was and it still is God's plan for sex. It was not meant to be outside of the of the marriage. God wants your sex life to be amazing, but it needs to be amazing with the person that you married. I like this analogy. Think of sex like fire and marriage like a fireplace. When the fire stays in the fireplace, it gives off light and warmth to the entire house. But when you take the fire out of the fireplace and spread it around to other places, everybody gets burned. So keep your fire burning bright in your fireplace and make sex a priority in your marriage. That's right. One of the most frustrating marriage issues that is heard from uh, most of the time from husbands and sometimes from wives is about sexual neglect. It's pretty common. We don't think about it. You just expect that all husbands and wives just kind of, it just naturally happens, but that's not the case. Most marriages will face seasons where one or both spouses feel a certain amount of sexual neglect. Depending on what time or season of life people are in, that just happens. If it's left unchecked, this season can morph and change into a new reality where it's difficult to even restart. And then the marriage can either end in divorce or a life that's just frustrated and unfulfilled coexisting with your spouse. And that's not what, what God meant for it to be. Another reason that it's so important for us to be open and honest and vulnerable with our spouse. Where, where are they going? <laughs> you know, they chose us. Mm -hmm. They love us. So be open and honest about things. Sexual neglect leaves one feeling abandoned, rejected, sad, hurt, frustrated, confused, angry, and unloved. And we don't want our, our husband or our wife to feel that way. That's, we didn't marry them to cause them sadness, to cause them anger. Withholding sex from your spouse is like infidelity. It's a basic duty as a spouse. It's what we're supposed to do. Men, more so than women, most often feel sexual neglect. And to help with sexual neglect, men, I've got something for you, and don't worry, women, I'm, I'm coming after you in a minute. I'm coming after my own self, too. So <laughs> here's what you can do. If you are feeling like she never wants to go to bed with me. She never wants to be alone with me. She never wants to um, provide me the intimacy that I'm needing. Learn her love language. Women don't speak the same love language as men. We don't think like men. We don't, we don't act like men. We don't react like men. And our bodies <coughs> are not like men. So learn her love language. Serve her unselfishly. As Christ loves and serves the church. Let your words be tender. And speak in a loving tone. If you want to push me away from you. Start fussing at me. It's a sure sign. That I don't want to be in the room with you. Whether it's the kitchen. Where the food is. Or the bedroom. Talk to me mean. I don't care where you're at. You can sleep on the porch. Not really. But, <laughs> but don't talk to me mean. I don't like it. Consider loving her. And serving her as a privilege. 
Look for ways to reconnect outside the bedroom. Don't focus on that part. I know you need that part. I know that part is desirable. But don't focus on that. Love her. Look for ways to laugh together. Go on date nights. I thought this was cute. Chore play. Help with the chores. If you ever want to feel close to your wife, wash the dishes. <laughs> Sweep the floor. Let her see you doing something like that. She'll be like, that's my man right there <laughs> helping me around the house. Most women um, want their mental to-do list clear before she can even focus on what is going to go on in that bedroom after a while, no matter how good it is. If, if your mind's not clear, you can't even focus on what's going on in there. You're thinking about the sick kids or the, the, the dirty laundry in the floor or what you have to do tomorrow. So if you help her out, she'll be more likely to help you out. Now, that, whilst that's not an easy way out, you can't just say, oh, I, I'm stressed tonight. We just, we just got to wait every night, 365 days in a row. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> not even 30 days in a row. Don't do that. Because I promise you, if you won't give in, somebody else will. Mm -hmm. And men are wired that way. So, be careful. Foreplay does not begin for women five minutes before bed. That's not happening that way. <laughs> that's, the la that's where the laundry and the dishes come in. That's it. <laughs> it starts when you wake up. Yeah. Each text that you send, each call that you make, the winks, the hugs, the kisses, the help you give, the I love you's. Make a reconnection and rebuild your connection together. So if you're facing something like this in your marriage, don't quit on each other. Don't give up. Fight for each other, not against each other. Don't blame each other and don't assume the worst of each other either. Believe the best in your spouse and choose to trust that God is going to carry you through. Your best days are ahead if you don't give up. All right, ladies, here we come. All these things that clutter our brains. We have to get rid of it. We have to de-stress. We can't always go to bed stressed and use that as, as an excuse to maybe tomorrow. It, it cannot be that way. It's hard sometimes to feel desirable to your spouse. As women, we think we have to look like what's been portrayed on the TV shows or look like the lady in the magazine before our husband is going to think that we're beautiful not the case. They married us. They've been with us through the weight gain. They've been with us through the children. They've been with us through the surgeries. They've been with us through all those things. They're still there. They still love us. But we feel stress and then we obsess about how we look, about not what, what we think we should be. And that just kills our desire, desire for sex altogether. When you feel unattractive, Sex is the last thing on your mind. You don't care about it. Truth is, the less often we have sex, the less we desire to have sex. That's not, not true for men, but for women. So the less often, then the less you desire it, which is not good for your, your husband. As women, we need to embrace our current body, not stress over the ideal body. We can't fully engage in sex and be worried about stretch marks or cellulite at the same time. Stress makes us feel tired and unmotivated to do anything, especially intimacy in the bedroom. We need to intentionally shift our thoughts. Next time you start thinking about your body and you're like, I'm not good enough, I don't look like what I want to look like, shut those thoughts down and replace them with positive thoughts. Don't torture yourself. You are who you are. He loves you. Just get over it. Love yourself. Because I promise you, that that's not bothering him. Confidence and intentional self-acceptance will help us to de-stress and become and be more in the mood for romance. So be confident and accept yourself. Now I'm not saying that weight cannot hinder, because it can. And so, and we need to take care of ourselves. But your husband loves you like you are. And so don't feel afraid or less than to give him what he needs. Who wants a better marriage? Anybody? 
I've got the answer. A great marriage builder is to have sex more often than your husband. It makes your marriage better. I don't know if y'all are as uncomfortable as I am in a class full of men and women. But this is uncomfortable for me. But it's the truth. And we need to know it. We need to hear it. So let's go back to Adam and Eve. Our first picture of the, of the first married couple tells us that they were naked and unashamed. I'm sure they were in good shape. But guess what? They were not naked and perfect. I'm sure Eve had some, like, thorn scratches on her leg. And all that stuff she ran through, there's no telling what was wrong with her body. She wasn't perfect. And Adam was the same. She didn't have a belly button. No belly button. She had to look silly. <laughs> it was not about comparison. It wasn't about looking in the mirror. You know why? Mirrors didn't exist. It wasn't about that. They had a beautiful connection of intimacy because they were focused on each other's souls, on who they were, not the physical imperfections. So find the courage and the vulnerability to be naked and unashamed with your spouse. It will take time. It's not easy. But it will create comfort, security, and intimacy in your marriage bed and every other part of your marriage. If you can be comfortable there, you can be comfortable anywhere. Women usually feel uncomfortable being seen. We've already said that. But your spouse wants to see you. Men are wired to be engaged through visual, visual stimulus. So when we have physical insecurities, it starts a domino effect. You don't feel good about yourself, so you don't want to be intimate. You don't want to be intimate, so you get uncomfortable when, you're, when your spouse initiates intimacy. Then... Your spouse gets hurt feeling, and the marriage gets stuck in a negative cycle all over again. I don't feel comfortable, and you want to do this, and I don't. And I, now I feel more uncomfortable, and where does it ever stop if you don't talk about it? Rewire your thinking. Women, we have, we have to love our husbands. We do love our husbands. But we often find it hard to get in the mood for things that they want between work, I've already said it, kids, household duties, extracurricular activities. Bob, have you ever felt like a chauffeur as a wife? You're not there yet, but you will be. <laughs> Sometimes I do. And there you go. You've all, I'm do. taking somebody somewhere all the time. Not anymore. My kids have cars now, but for about 10 years there, it was like I, I'm putting thousands of miles on my car a week, just going back and forth. Homework, church, everything else. It can be difficult to shut down the mental clutter. So intimacy just becomes another thing on the to-do list. Oh, we've got to do that tonight. Look, can we just put that, put that off till tomorrow? We start resenting it. Really? And we miss out on the incredible gift that God designed it to be for a husband and wife. So how do we break that cycle that continues to go? Approach the mental clutter. We might have a checklist, but if we don't check things off that checklist, things aren't getting done. So we need to approach the clutter that's in our minds. Just like we clean out the clutter in our homes, get rid of negative thoughts. In 2 Corinthians 10 and 5, it says we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So the Bible tells us to take our thoughts captive. Every thought. So negative thoughts, we need to take them captive. Take a step back and reorganize the processes that um, shut you down when it comes to intimacy. What is it that makes you not want to go to bed at night? What is it that makes you want to stay up late and watch TV instead of going to sleep with your husband? What tends to be in the forefront of your mind? Pinpoint these issues, figure it out, and recognize the negative thoughts as they come and choose to approach intimacy more positively. It's not a bad thing. It's a privilege for a husband and wife to be on, the only legitimate means to meet this God-given need. There is only one man in your life that can take care of those needs. Don't deprive him of that. And 
the other way for men. There's only one woman in your life that should take care of those needs. So when thoughts like, I don't have time, I'm too tired, really? We just did that yesterday. When that comes to your mind, stop those thoughts. Stop them in their tracks. Replace them with the truth. And the truth is that sex is a healthy desire and a gift from God. And it's meant explicitly for marriage. Regular intimacy brings a married couple closer together and it relieves stress. If you need a stress reducer, you don't need a pill. Go to bed with your husband. Go to bed with your wife. It will reduce stress. Here's what we need to realize. Are you women ready? I mean, you can't use this against them when they get home. Not yet. Maybe in a few weeks, but not tonight. <laughs> Having sex with your husband and investing in your marriage is more important than folding laundry or packing school lunches right at that moment. It's important to take care of the needs of our spouse. Sometimes the pressure that we feel is not from a, not from a to-do list. When we're talking about pressures that keep us from enjoying things. It's mental stress such as fear, worry, insecurity. They zap our energy so much that we have little, if anything, left to give to our spouse. When you're tired and worn out and your mind is just in a, a mess, you can't even hardly think straight, much less give somebody your attention or even your love at that time. <clears throat> the longer you go without intimacy, the more pressure and even the more awkwardness that you feel. Let's just wait next week. Well, next week something else will happen. Well, it's weird. It's been a few weeks. It shouldn't be a few weeks ever. Ladies, when we reject our husband's advances, let me tell you what happens to them. We make them feel like we don't desire them, like we don't love them, and like we don't respect them. But when we open up and have a conversation with him about our fears and our insecurities and our worries, we prepare the path of intimacy. We let them know. If you're going to bear all of that to them, they know that you love them. So give your husband a, an, an opportunity to pray with you about the things that you're feeling. And maybe offer a perspective. Maybe you feel like he sees it one way, but when you start talking about it, it, he doesn't even feel that way at all. But you're never going to know until you open up that conversation. He might be the support and encouragement that you really needed in the first place. So we can't expect anxious thoughts, thoughts just to go away. If you never deal with anxiety, if you have anxiety you never deal with it, it's not going to go away. You have to, um, you have to approach it. Prayer first of all, and then having somebody that you can talk to. The more we open up with our spouses, the more we will be free of this mental clutter, this anxiety that we face in our mind. Over time, we'll have peace of mind and balance like we desire, and we'll cut, cultivate a thriving, intimate life and marriage. I said this earlier. Remember that sex is never just a physical act. There are mental and emotional strings that are attached. And when a man is sexually frustrated, he feels rejected and disconnected from his wife. So in situations like that, when, when you feel neglected in that area, it's not about who's right and who's wrong when it comes to desires for intimacy or what goes on in the undefiled marriage bed. It's about communicating with transparency and expressing feelings with vulnerability, serving each other's needs with selflessness, thoughtfulness, mutual respect, and love. Take care of each other. The goal is to find a solution that will strengthen your marriage. Most couples won't, they won't have, or they don't know how to have these types of conversations because you have to open up and, see, and be so vulnerable. It feels very scary. So connection between your two spouses begins with communication. Communicate, communicate, communicate. Talk about it even though it's awkward. Talk about how you feel even though it's, it's awkward. Talk about it. When you improve connection 
You also improve your intimate life and you also improve every other area of your, your relationship. So there's usually one spouse who has a greater desire for intimacy than the other. And that's okay. It's normal. Um, there's a book called His Needs and Her Needs by Willard F. Harley. And it explains that the couple should try to aim to have sex as often as possible to fulfill this need and protect the marriage. So here is what the Message Bible, how it translates the scripture that we read earlier. 1 Corinthians 7, 3-4. It's good for a man to have a wife and for a woman to have a husband. Sexual drives are strong, but marriage is strong enough to contain them and provide for a balanced and fulfilling sexual life in a world of sexual disorder. The marriage bed must be a place of mutuality, the husband seeking to satisfy his wife, the wife seeking to satisfy her husband. Marriage is not a place to stand up for your rights. That's the Message Bible translation. I'm sure you can find that online if you want to go back and read that again. But marriage is a decision to serve each other. Whether it's serving meals, whether it's helping in the yard, or if it's serving in the bedroom. And scripture tells us that abstaining from sex is permissible only for periods of times if you both agree for it. If you're fasting for a, an amount of time, then yes, it's permissible to abstain but only for those times, then come back together again. There's too much at stake for us to, to abstain altogether. Our marital intimacy is at stake, our sexual health, and most importantly, our commitment to the one that we love the most. I chose to spend my life with my husband. I don't want to hurt him. I want to do everything that I can for him. And I want to be committed to him. I love him. More than anything, God designed sex specifically for marriage. I've probably said that five times. He wants us to have a healthy, enjoyable, and thriving sex life with our spouse. So let's don't withhold this from each other. I'm almost finished. Friendship is the fertile soil in which a healthy sex life can grow and thrive. Uh, I talked about it earlier. Maybe in your past... You have had other relationships. And because of sexual intimacy that might have occurred, occurred, you feel a tie to that person. But that's not the way God intended for it. But you were probably friends. Or you had a relationship before you ever had that relationship. Friendship is what grows a healthy sex life and it can, where it can grow and thrive. Cultivating your friendship with your spouse will also help you both create, both of you create a vibrant sex life. But it takes time. Not just time, intentionality. You've got to be purposeful about what you're doing to and for your spouse. To foster an ongoing friendship with your spouse is what makes our lives vibrant. No matter if it's inside the bedroom or outside. So let's get busy. We don't have a problem in the beginning. Like 23 years ago, there was no problem. <laughs> you know, it was just like, oh, it, oh, that's the way it's supposed to be. So why 23 years later or 15 years later do we think that that's changed? <coughs> it hasn't. It's the same. So go on walks. Hold hands. Talk. This keeps us connected to each other every day. All right, guys, the non-sexual touch is huge for your wife and for cultivating intimacy with her. I taught you about chore play. Do a chore for her. Non-sexual touch, a hug or a pat on the back or rub her feet. Whatever it is, don't touch mine. I don't like it. But whatever it is that your spouse enjoys, a back rub, um, I don't know, a hand massage, whatever it is that has nothing to do with the bedroom, do that for her. And then open communication throughout the day is the best foreplay for your wife. If you intend for something else to happen, do something like that for her. It's the easiest way to make it happen. Women feel more inclined 
to have sex with their husbands when they feel connected to them emotionally and intellectually. If I can talk to you about something, you've got my attention. And like, if I can have a good conversation with my husband, I feel like he's listening. Even if I'm, if it's Greek to him, if I feel like he's paying attention and, and giving me good feedback, I feel connected to him. I feel like he's getting me. They're not that way. They're different, but that's how we are. So if you feel like your wife never wants intimacy, then think about it. When's the last time you had a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with her? When did you talk to her about the things that she enjoys? When, the la when is the last time you gave her that touch and listened to her and really shared your heart? This is how intimacy starts with a woman and what leads her to the bedroom. A woman's emotional state directly affects her sex drive. We talked about that earlier. If she's not mentally stable and mentally clear, that is by far going to be the last thing on her mind or on her list to do. We want to feel close to our husbands before we become intimate with them. We can't argue and hurt each other's feelings one minute and then flip a switch and just go pop in the bed and everything be okay. We're not that way. Because visual is not what does it for women. It doesn't happen that way. Guys can be fighting mad and they see something and boom, there it is. Not for women. We've got to... We've got to clear all of that out of our minds. We need to make amends verbally and emotionally before any makeup sex can happen. Hear what she's saying. She wants to hear your response straight from your heart. No nods or uh-huh. That's not what she wants to hear. Conversate. Tell her what's on your mind and your heart and don't hold back. She wants to connect with you through intimate conversation before it is. So, God created sex. He created love. He created life. He created you. And He has a beautiful plan for your life and for your marriage. So explore God's plan for, your, for, um, for sex, for your marriage. Make intimacy and fulfillment a high priority in the marriage. And put your spouse's needs ahead of your own. That's what we do when we serve people. We put them ahead of us. Selflessness is the key to a great sex life and the key to a great friendship and marriage outside the bedroom. So this week I'm not going to assign a specific um, podcast for you to listen to. I want you to find something on the topic, but some of you might have emotional hurts and you might need to listen to the podcast about emotional hurts and um, things like that before you ever even move on to um, talking about things in the bedroom. So find something that uh, that has to deal with you and the subject of <coughs> intimacy with your spouse and listen to a podcast about that this week. Maybe you can, since I'm not assigning anything, maybe you can text me the name of what, um, what you listen to or uh, maybe your wife can text me what both of you listen to however you'd like to do that. So find a podcast to listen to this week and let's grow closer together.